Hello and welcome to Talking Heads, our Bible study looking at the book of Numbers. You are probably wondering what kind of insanity is making him film this in the kitchen. Is the next step going to be that it will be broadcasting mass celebrated on the kitchen table or other such abominations? Do not worry, there is method in my madness. Normally when we have Talking Heads in the upper room at St Wilfrid's, we have cake. So I thought that we ought to have some cake. I know only I can eat it, but you can watch it and you can have cake at home uh, while you are watching. And I thought, what kind of cake to have with uh, the book of numbers? The answer is obvious, hundreds and thousands cake. So we're going to make some hundreds and thousands cake. For the cake itself, you will need eight ounces of softened butter with eight ounces of golden sh caster sugar, a little bit of vanilla essence, three eggs, the beginning of all this lockdown, it was very difficult to get eggs. People were putting them all in one basket, thinking that chickens were going to stop laying. Now it seems to be easier, so you should be able to get those. A little bit of baking powder, a little bit of salt, um, five tablespoons of milk, and nine ounces of self-raising flour. Now, this is the fun bit. You get to whisk together, mix together with an electric whisk press, preferably the softened butter, and the uh, golden caster sugar. Next thing, beat in the vanilla essence and the eggs. Other brands are, of course, available. Put the vanilla in. One. Three. Then add in the flour, salt and baking powder. Stir in the milk until it's just combined. Finally, put the mixture in a greased cake tin. Put it in the oven for 25 minutes on gas mark 4 or 180 degrees. And while you're waiting for it to cook, read 20, chapter 25 of the Book of Numbers. So, never let it be said that I care more about aesthetics than substance. That's now ready to go in the oven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed Lord, who hast caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of thy holy word we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of eternal life, which thou hast given us in our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So today we're going to read chapter 25 of Numbers. If you remember the story so far, Balaam, the mercenary prophet with his donkey, has been called by Balak, king of Moab, to curse Israel. Three times he's tried to do it. Three times he's failed because the Lord doesn't want him to. And in fact, he's given them the most extravagant blessings. As so often uh, with these books of the Pentateuch, the story of Moses and the people of Israel. Everything seems to be going absolutely brilliantly. Everything's marvellous. And then we get let down with a thump. And actually, I'm afraid that in this chapter we're going to see one of the most challenging, difficult and upsetting passages in the whole of the Torah. And Israel stayed at Shittim, and the people began to go whoring with the daughters of Moab. So this place, which means acacias, it sounds very jolly, a very pleasant place to be. And 
the people of Israel, they were ready now to go into the promised land, to take their inheritance that the Lord has promised them. They've been wonderfully blessed by him, fed by him, led by him, guarded by him. And what do they do? They are seduced by these daughters of Moab. They go whoring after them. And why is that so bad? Uh, we tend to think, you know, if you uh, uh, settle in, in a, uh, a different country and you, uh, uh, you know, settle down, marry the local inhabitants, that's quite a good thing, isn't it? Well, the next verse tells us why consistently in the Bible this is seen as something uh, absolutely evil. And they called the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. I think we have to understand that these Israelites are more than just confused about the philosophical nature of religion. They are committing an act of treachery. It's a bit like Judas. You know, they've seen the miracles. They've been fed with the manna. They've seen the water gushing out from the rock. And they exchange the God who was their glory for this tin pot little local deity who isn't really a God at all. And Israel clung to Baal Peor. These gods, the Baals, um, uh, Baal is going to be, you know, the, the God that they're continually turning to uh, once they're settled in the Promised Land. Think forward to when Elijah has his contest on uh, the top of Mount Carmel with the priests of Baal. Um, they cling to Baal Peor and the Lord's wrath flared against Israel. We might think this is getting very repetitive and boring. Isn't this just a repeat of what's happened again and again? Isn't this just what happened um, with the worship of the golden calf? I think this is worse. The worship of the golden calf was clearly bad and it involved Aaron as well, but in one sense the golden calf was kind of a substitute for God himself, almost a symbol of him. Later on um, in the uh, northern kingdom of Israel they actually had two golden calves and remained more or less um, uh, monotheistic. Here they're actually turning to a completely false god, a God who, you know, demands horrible um, cultic sacrifices, perhaps involving human beings, who um, demands cultic prostitution in the temples. Uh, this is a God whose whole uh, moral um, hierarchy is the, in, uh, is the opposite of that of the real God, the God of Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, take the chiefs of the people and impale them to the Lord before the sun, that the Lord's flaring wrath turn away from Israel. This is where we get the big problem, isn't it? Um, the problem that we always seem to face with the Old Testament. Is this a God of wrath and anger to be compared with the New Testament God of love and forgiveness and compassion? The answer, of course, is no. We already know, we've seen it, that God forgives his people again and again. But sin has consequences. We also have to remember, uh, given what's going to happen next, that this is a time of war. And just as somebody who betrays his country, who um, goes over to the enemy in a time of war, um, is executed more or less without any questions being asked, this is what these men of Israel have done. Uh, they have betrayed the God who loves him. Um, they've uh, whored with these, these false gods and the women who induced them to follow them. And Moses said to the judges of Israel, each of you kill his men who cling to Baal Peor. So again, we also see that there is, uh, there is a choice being made there. They can turn away at that moment. It's when they cling uh, to this insidious, evil uh, false religion uh, that they are to be killed. And look, a man of the Israelites came and brought forth to his kinsman the Midianite woman before the eyes of Moses and before the eyes of the whole community of Israelites as they were weeping at the entrance to the tent of meeting. Try to understand what's happening here. The Israelites are weeping because they see this infidelity, uh, this wickedness, this evil. 
and they know that those who refuse to turn back will be lost. And this man uh, openly brings a Midianite woman um, before the eyes of the whole people. And the implication is, in fact, that they, um, they consort together in front of everyone. Now, before we go on to the next bit, and before we easily assume that there's a kind of casual racism here uh, in the book of Numbers, just remember who Moses' wife was. Go back to the book of Exodus. She's Zipporah. And whose daughter was she? She was the daughter of Jethro, the priest of Midian. Jethro, who becomes uh, the first person to recognise from the outside uh, God's goodness to Israel and to give good advice to Moses. So it isn't simply uh, that God loves some people and not others. It's what these Midianites are doing that is the problem. Although, of course, it's a problem for Moses. He finds it hard to take decisive action to be a leader at this point because he too is married to a Midianite woman. And in fact, even his own brother and sister, Aaron and Miriam, have in the past criticised him for that. And Phineas, son of Eleazar, son of Aaron the priest, saw. And he rose from the midst of the community and took a spear in his hand. And he came after the man of Israel into the alcove and stabbed the two of them, the man of Israel and the woman, in her alcove. And the scourge was held back from the Israelites. Wow, that's pretty fierce stuff. Um, uh, you might wonder, you know, is this really family viewing? Uh, there is Phineas going and running them through when they're actually in flagrante. We have to be careful not always to assume that the, these zealots, and Phineas is the arch-zealot, we might say, um, in the scriptures, um, always have God's approval. Later on, we'll see Phineas has to do something rather more peaceful, perhaps as a way of, of atoning for this, um, this wrath that he shows forth. Nevertheless, even in the Psalms, his zeal is commended. And we see that it's because of that zeal that the wrath of God is turned away. I think what we can say, as we've seen with other scourges and plagues and epidemics and pandemics, it's not that God causes them. God never wants us to suffer. But the way that we order the world, the way that we live our lives, the way that original sin has corrupted human beings, inevitably has consequences. And this um, profound disunity that's created by this man consorting with the Midianite woman inevitably causes a grave rupture in Israel. And those who died in the scourge came to 24,000. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Phineas, son of Eleazar, son of Aaron, the priest, turned away my wrath from the Israelites when he zealously acted for my zeal in their midst, and I did not put an end to the Israelites through my zeal. So we see that Phineas's actions do stave off God's wrath. But our Cardinal St. John Henry Newman in one of his parochial and plain sermons says that we can admire Phineas's zeal without in any way being called to imitate him. Our zeal should always be for the things of God, against idolatry, for the love of God, for uh, carrying out his commandments. But we know uh, that actually uh, violent responses to sin uh, are not part of the way God wants us to act. Therefore uh, say, I hereby grant him my covenant of peace. It's very pointed, isn't it? The Lord says, all right, well done for the zeal, Phineas, and I'm giving you a covenant of peace peace. He's actually telling him, you need to find a new way of bringing about my will. I grant him my covenant of peace, and it shall be for him and for his seed after him a covenant of perpetual priesthood, in recompense for his acting zealously for his God and atoning for the Israelites. Remember before, after the golden calf incident, the Levites went through 
with the edge of the sword, slaughtering those who were responsible. And that blood was seen as their ordination, as giving them uh, a role in the future temple uh, as Levites, assistants to the priests uh, forever. And Phineas, who's the son of Eleazar, who's the son of Aaron, the high priest, he's seen as by this blood entering into the covenant of peace, and it will be his descendants ever afterwards who will be the high priests. And just to show us that this is real people with real circumstances, we hear next, and the name of the man of Israel who was struck down, who was struck down with the Midianite woman, was Zimri, son of Salu, chieftain of the Simeonite father's house. Something interesting there, as an aside, we see that it doesn't matter how high a position you have, God's law is God's law. This is quite different from, say, Egyptian culture, where those at the top could do what they like. It didn't matter that he was the son of Salu, the chieftain of the Simeonites. He does wrong, and he gets punished. And the name of the Midianite woman who was struck down was Cosby. Such a pretty name, um, but uh, it seems that she didn't do very pretty things. Cosby, daughter of Zer, who was chieftain of the leagues of fathers' houses in Midian. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Be foes to the Midianites and strike them, for they have been foes to you through their wiles that they practised upon you in the matter of Peor and in the matter of Cosby, daughter of the chieftain of Midian, their kinswoman, who was struck down on the day of the scourge over the matter of Peor. And so Midian becomes an emblem of all that is foreign to God. Just remember, though, Ruth, the Moabitess, will marry into uh, the line uh, of, uh, that will be the ancestors of King David, and so of our Lord, she marries Boaz. Um, and so there is a sense that later on, all these things will be redeemed. Well, that is quite a distressing chapter, a difficult one for us to read. Um, when we come to chapter 26, we might cheer up a bit, um, uh, even though uh, there are lots and lots of numbers, as you might expect in it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our Lady Queen of the Oratory, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Holy Father Saint Philip, pray for us. Bless Saint John Henry Newman, pray for us. Saint Wilfrid, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So probably the lesson of the cake is don't try this at home. Um, it's kind of collapsed in a bit and taken ages to cook, but we'll take it out of the oven. It's what it tastes like, not what it looks like that matters. Um, I should say that one reason I've made a cake today is actually because it's my birthday and I'd just like to say a thank you to Anthony, who's a little boy from East Hankbourne, who just sent me a YouTube video of him singing happy birthday to me. Um, this won't be published on our YouTube channel for a little bit, but uh, when it does, thank you very much for your best wishes. Now let's see this cake. Okay, so, oh yes, it's sort of burnt and not quite cooked at the same time. But there we are. Uh, turn the oven off and put it to cool. Sift eight ounces of icing sugar into a bowl. Okay, I'm going to do a bit that I don't want you to film. Okay. So the truth is the sift. Um, the next thing is making a well. Do I need to zoom in for that? Uh, no, not really, because it won't look very good. <laughs> you know everyone will be writing in saying you don't make cakes like that at all. It was rubbish. Really? Don't they? Or with any luck, they'll send us lots of cakes. They'll say the poor thing is <sighs> just incapable of doing anything decent. Okay, so... So then you add half a tablespoon of vanilla essence to the icing and a couple of tablespoons, which I can't be bothered to measure with the spoons. 
make a well in the middle and you're gradually mixing the icing sugar with the milk and the vanilla essence and it should make a nice kind of icing consistency. Um, you can vary the amount of milk depending on uh, what you want your icing to be like really. So finally you want to pour the icing over the cake, uh, which we do like so. Very simple. And last of all, to turn this into a cake representing the Lord's teeming myriads, we need hundreds and thousands. And we pour those in a very generous manner over the top of the cake. And look how beautiful it is now, despite its rather odd shape. So, if I survive eating the cake, you can tune in next time for chapter 26 of the Book of Numbers. Happy Easter. Goodbye. God bless. Or the